Well, welcome to Beacon. My name's Calvin. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, years ago, my dad was a guest preacher at a church, and uh, he, he showed up to this church a little early to be prepared. And, and when he walks in, there was this 12-year-old kid, boy, um, setting up the chairs on his own and, and putting all the bulletins, the programs on every single chair. My dad was like, where's his parents? What 12-year-old boy is... Uh, unsupervised, doing some great things like this, uh, not being, maybe the parents are there watching, forcing him to, or I don't know, but, but he went up to this, this kid and said, who told you to do this? And, and the kid looked at my dad and said, well, nobody did. I just saw that it needed to be done, and I wanted to be a part of it. I love that. Motivation matters. Motivation, why we do things, the reason why we do things matter. And, uh, um, I don't know why you're here today. I don't know what motivated you to come today. I don't know what motivates you in life to get up every day or to do things the way that you do them. But I do know that motivation matters. The reason behind things. Um, my, my wife Tara and I, we're very thankful for everybody who has uh, uh, generously given us gifts and invested and prayed for a child that's uh, coming. And uh, we're, we're excited for that and thankful um, but recently, uh, some of our friends, their kids, uh, little toddlers, they, they picked out gifts for us themselves. I think the mom said she helped them sway away from the girl stuff and more to the boy stuff. But, but they picked out gifts and, and, and they came to us and they gave them to us and they were so excited. And everything that Tara pulled out, um, that one of the, there was a boy and a girl, the, the boy or the girl was like, oh, I got that one. I chose that one. They were, they were just so happy and excited. And, and I've realized that how a gift is given can make it so much sweeter to receive. Don't you agree with that? How a gift is given, not just money, uh, that is important, but words, words of affirmation, encouragement, how words are are delivered matters, right? If you look at someone and go, I love you. <laughs> Not quite the same as I love you. How you do something matters. The motivation, the, the reason why you're doing something matters. And, and I believe that whether it's your time, whether it's your, your talents, what you're good at, whether it's your money, your, your possessions, and, and, and whatever you're investing, I believe that God loves when we are filled with joy. God loves a cheerful giver. God wants us to be joyful. And, and, and not only God, but I'll be honest, I want people to be cheerful. I want people to be joyful when they, when they speak words of encouragement, when they invest money or their gifts or their talents into different things, because I think that our world needs a little more joy in it. Don't you agree? It needs more love in our world. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not one of those airy-fairy, love everybody all the time and whatever, it doesn't matter how they act or live. No, love is grace and truth. We don't throw, away, uh, throw around love like the rom-coms where everyone loves everyone and it feels like you just throw it away. Love matters. And we want to look at how Jesus loves us and we want to follow that example and be a church that loves generously. Um, last week, we started uh, our series, Give and Take, and and it's a series on our finances, on giving, and uh, bear with me, it's only two weeks, and today is the last one, so it's going to be okay. We're going to get through it, and I don't know what your understanding or your teaching or church has been like for you when, when you've heard about money, um, but I don't, I don't want to make any assumptions. Last week, we talked about how we want to know God's best for us. That's what we want in every element of our life, right? If you could get God's best for you when it comes to relationships, you'd probably say, yes, please. When it comes to how you view yourself, when it comes to your work, when it comes to every area of, of your life, and, and nothing is different when it comes to our possessions, our money, our stuff. And so as we looked at that, we looked at the principle that, that our role when it comes to money is to be a steward of what God has given us. We talked about how God's provided everything, right? God created the world, and he, He's provided everything for us, and so He calls us to be a steward to look at his best and how he lays out a framework for how he wants us to live. Now we can see in the New Testament that God's framework is, is much more descriptive than it is prescriptive. Now, if you're like me, I like structure and I like bullet point lists and I like to know what is expected. And I think maybe it's because I don't like to let people down. I don't know. Maybe that's uh, between me and uh, someone I can talk to. But there's different things that 
that, that I enjoy and that I like. And when it comes to God's best, I really would, in, I really would love to have just a bullet point list of here's what you need to do. But as I look at the New Testament where how God calls us to be generous, how He calls us to view finances, I I see that it's not quite that way. Um, We uh, left last week with this quote that I invited you to just mull over to think about this week, and I hope you took some time to do that. The quote was from Richard Foster, and it says this, Rather than how much of my money should I give to God, we learn to ask, how much of God's money should I keep for myself? It's a principle that I would encourage everybody to think about because um, the world we live in, it, it really encourages earn more and enjoy more and get bigger, better, stronger, and, 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 and progress. But what if God has a different framework that He lives on? What if He has something that is better for us than maybe what we see every day in our world, and I think that that's true. So today, I, I want to talk about um, the second part of this series. We've, we've looked at God's best, and today I want to talk about our choice. And this is what I love about God, because God doesn't, uh, He doesn't say, I'm going to force you to obey me, and this is what's required when it comes to our money and giving today. What He does is He allows us to choose, and this, this is amazing. This is a great principle, and um, the truth is, Everyone here is making a choice when it comes to money. The question is, do you want it to be intentionally chosen or unintentionally occur? I don't know about you, but my bank account either goes up, well, usually goes down through the month, and then you get paid and it goes up a little. It it, it ebbs and flows. And and either you're intentionally spending, saving, or you're unintentionally allowing it to occur. And and I think that in this, um, I would encourage each and every one of us to ask this question. What does God want me, or if you're married or in a family, us to do with the money we have? Just think about that. It's probably a good question to ask regularly, right? A lot of what our, our lives revolve around is money. Jesus talked about money a lot. A lot of his parables, a lot of his teachings was, was uh, focused on money. Well, why? Because our lives, a big part of it, revolve around our finances. What we get to do or what we don't get to do where we work or where we don't work, what we want to do, and, and all these different things. And so uh, the encouragement today is to ask this question, what does God want you to do with the money you're called to steward? Um, and this question, it really goes in line with our memory verse, right? Our memory verse is found in Psalm 116, verse 12. And so let's read this verse out loud together. It goes like this. What shall I return to the Lord for all His goodness to me? We have a good God. Ah, it's I think I need to be reminded about that often. Because in my life and in the world, it can kind of seem like chaos occurs sometimes. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? Why not this? Why not that? Why this? I need to remind myself we have a good God who loves me. He loves you. And as you reflect um, on this question, I want to draw us back to a verse we shared last week in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. It said this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. This is a, an amazing verse right here. It's talking about what it means to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the, the joy of the gospel. The truth is that uh, through Jesus, and only Jesus, we're able to have eternal security, to know where we're going. God wants you to spend eternity with him in heaven. Do you believe that? And we have a choice. We can either accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior or reject it. And He wants us to say yes. And so out of this, I think that the grace that Jesus shows us leads me to this, this, this point, which I want to be clear on this, that grace never looks for a reason because the reason is Jesus. So you to show grace to others, you shouldn't have to look for a reason do they deserve it. You should look for an opportunity. Grace never looks for a reason, it only looks for an opportunity, because Jesus is the one that shows ultimate grace. So if we have our eternal assurance, like we know where we're going for eternity, I mean, it puts it into perspective, right? My life is this long, and eternity is, I can't even d- demonstrate it. I don't know how to demonstrate eternity. It's this long, right? It's as long as you could think. It's forever. 
that's what matters so much more. Life, I feel like, is a preparation for eternity that we're going to spend with God. And thank God that he saw me as an opportunity. Can you imagine if it's like, all right, Calvin, so I want to show you grace, um, but you did this, this, and this, so I'm not going to. That's how I often view things, right? I often have a, a list of reasons why I don't want to show someone grace because they don't deserve it. Come on. They made some terrible choices. They deserve where, where they are today. That's not what God does. And thank God he saw me, he saw you as an opportunity for him to take what we deserve through his mercy and give what we don't deserve through his grace. So as we reflect on this example of, of everything that Jesus has done for us, it puts it into a, a different framework, right? And then if you see money, possessions, and giving through that lens, the lens of the gospel, what Jesus has done for you, I hope it starts to reframe maybe your idea and, and conversation about money um, so that you can examine it more through your heart and your choices through a lens of the gospel. Uh, I, I'm going to share a few things today that I think as Christians, God wants us to choose when it comes to, to money. And the first one is this, choose to be faithful. I uh, have a friend, she uh, works at a, a local gas station and she came uh, to a group the other night and um, she had a coffee cup with her. You know, you, that's normal, it's coffee. I guess it was later in the evening, but she was drinking coffee and, and uh, uh, someone goes, wait a second, what gas station do you work at? She goes, and she, she starts laughing and she came with a coffee from a different gas station than the one that she works at. <laughs> what does it mean to be faithful, right? <laughs> You ever seen someone in their, their uniform of a fast food restaurant standing in line at another restaurant? <laughs> Faithfulness, right? <laughs> what does it mean to be faithful? Um, I think we need to ask, faithful to what? What are we being faithful to? If we're to choose to be faithful with not just our finances, but our time and our, our gifts, everything about us, what are we choosing to be faithful to? Um, well, I think it's faithful to God's best as outlined in, in Scriptures. Faithful to the calling of what Jesus has given to us and what he calls us to follow. And in this, it means specifically with our finances to be a faithful steward of what we've been given. Now, a steward doesn't determine how much they've been given or how little. A steward, it, he or she doesn't determine what the purpose they need to use what they've been given is for because it's not theirs. So in essence, with our money, if God has provided everything for us, we need to use it in a way that is in line with his best because the steward doesn't own it. It's like when you rent a, uh, an apartment, you have to look at your lease or you have to get permission to do different things to the apartment. And oftentimes you don't want to pay for the upgrades. You want the owner to. So the owner says, well, I don't want to do those upgrades. <laughs> a steward is different. So if we're to be faithful, we want to be faithful and honor God as we see it through the lens of the gospel, because God's mission for his church, what we're sent out to do, we, we're sent out to um, spread the gospel, to teach, to disciple, to baptize, to tell people about Jesus, that there is a better way that leads to life. And so for us today, we, we, as we look at what it means to be faithful, I, I think we can break down our finances, money into two different parts. One is giving and the other is living. How we can give and then how to live. And so first we can look at giving. And Jesus in Acts 20, verse 35, he really frames this up pretty well for us. He says this, he's quoted as saying, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Do you believe it? I like getting gifts though, don't you? I mean, I think that uh, in, in talking to some grandparents, you really start to get to see this principle like really lived out. Because if you talk to a kid, you get an elementary school kid and give them no context and you say, would you like to give a gift or receive the gift you want? Come on. <laughs> Most of them are going to say receive, right? But when I connect with grandparents and I see the joy that they get in buying their grandkids gifts, oh, my mother-in-law is so excited to have a first grandchild. She just can't, can't wait and she loves to buy gifts and she, she's bought many gifts and she just is, is so excited for it. 
Jesus says it's better to give than to receive, and if he says it, then it's true. You may not like it, <laughs> but it's true. Um, giving is better than getting, and, and being a generous person or, I don't know, a generous family, a generous church, is going to have an impact for his kingdom in this world. As we follow Jesus, we want to be generous. And I think that as, as a church, as we love generously, people will notice. Not just with money, but with our words too. You know, I'm not from here, as many people point out with how I sound, but um, I, I have a lot of friends that come visit, people from part of a different country, and, and uh, you know, they, they all come with preconceived notions about, um, well, you guys, New Englanders. <laughs> And uh, these preconceived notions are, um, well, it's kind of, let me explain it this way. It's kind of like when you drive through the Dunkin' Donuts line. You don't expect the same experience at Dunk's as you do at Starbucks, right? At Starbucks, it's like, oh, it's great to see you today. How are you doing? Like, uh, what, what can I get you at Dunk's? Is, what do you want? <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I'm more of a Dunks guy, and I want to the point. I love that. But, but people come up, and they have these preconceived notions. Like, oh, New Englanders, they're so cold, and they don't love people. They're this, that, the other. But, but when they come up and they meet my friends, you guys, you know what they leave thinking? That was a load of nonsense. It's different. Now, um, they don't say that when they are renting a car and driving, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, as we look at... Uh, what, what it means to, to be generous. I just want to encourage us to see it through the lens of the gospel. Uh, the lens of Jesus has done all of this for me. My eternal assurance security is in him. And he is calling me to live out as a believer. But what and where should we give? <laughs> well, um, anytime you've probably heard at a church about giving and money, and you, you hear this word tithe. You ever heard the word tithing? Um, usually people say a tithe, um, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. A tithe is giving 10%. Now, sometimes people say, oh, I, I tithe, and they give 3%, 5%, 15% even. That's not a tithe. A tithe is 10%. That's the number. Um, but what is tithing? In Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, it says this. Uh, we can see this on the screen. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I'll not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So let's dig in a little bit deeper about tithing. Um, the Bible first mentions tithing in Genesis 14, where Abraham gives one-tenth of the spoils of war to Melchizedek, the priest, king of Salem. Throughout the Old Testament, tithes uh, were given to authority figures to determine how God wanted them to be used. Now, the tithe was the king's portion, and, and people gave it as a tribute or sign of honor to the person who was in authority above them. And so when God said to his people in the Old Testament to tithe, they would know exactly what he's saying to them. Because they would understand what God is saying is, if I am your king, if I am your God, then show me the honor and respect that you would through a tithe. It's about surrender. It's a heart issue. And so as we look at this and we say, who is our Lord and our Savior? Jesus is. And so out of that, he wants every element of our lives to be surrendered to him. And so for them in the Old Testament, the tithe would be a way of showing that God is their God. Now, um, th this was the king's portion. Now, I, I believe, and I think that scripturally, tithing is a helpful Focus the word helpful for a moment. Helpful Old Testament principle. And in the New Testament, Christians aren't ordered to tithe. It's not required. Now, some of you are saying like, yes, I knew it. I'm not required to tithe. It's all lies. <laughs> well, not quite. They're not ordered. They're not required. But they're encouraged to give from the heart. This is the difference. Now, sometimes it's hard to know Old Testament, New Testament. That, that's the two parts of the Bible, right? The Old Testament and, and then the New Testament after Jesus with all the, the Gospels and, and all the different letters from Paul. Um, but it's not required in the New Testament law. But I believe personally, and as a church, we believe that it is a good practice to, to start a, 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 to take tithing, 10% of your income, and invest it in the local church because you're invested in what God is doing through your local church. 
I think that as my wife and I look at this, we, we practice that as a good practice out of our hearts to say, we want God and His Son Jesus to be known in our community. We're a part of this. We're surrendered to Him. And so we want to invest in the work that He's doing. Um, but remember, I'm not saying that, oh, you have to give 10% to Beacon Church. No, I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that we want to be a part of that. And then for us, we pray through, okay, what is God? That's a starting point for us. And there's some years where, where we give 10% and some years where we're like, oh, we can do a little more. But there's other places we want to give to. We want to give to organizations that are helping share the, the gospel of Jesus around the world. We want to give to, to people who are in need, a part of our community or a part of uh, um, here at church or a part of our community uh, at work or different places. And and so for me and uh, my wife, Tara, we know that it's, it's a heart issue. It's asking God for his guidance in this. Um, however, uh, it, it may seem tough to talk about 10% of your income, right? You're sitting there thinking, I can't even pay all my bills right now. How am I supposed to take 10% of that and put that here and do this and do that? It, it's a math game, right? And, and I would just say that giving is a faith journey. Um, and... Uh, I'd encourage you to start giving some type of percentage of your income. Um, start somewhere. Now, it may start as a small percentage and you can work your way up or it may be there for a while. I don't, I don't really know, but, but start somewhere. Maybe it is just saying, I'm not going to buy that Starbucks coffee this week and I'm going to try it. I'm just going to give that amount of money. And, and uh, whether it's to the church, to an organization, to a person, wh whatever it is. But I would encourage you to do it on a regular occurrence, no matter the amount. Because remember, God cares more about faithfulness, choosing to be faithful, than he does the exact dollar amount. Uh, and I know this is true um, because one of the stories that Jesus shared was the widow's might. It's a story about a widow who doesn't have a lot of money. Um, and uh, maybe you resonate with not having a lot of money and you're like, that's me. <laughs> um, Jesus talks about this poor widow who came to the temple and uh, she had two copper coins that she gave. And then he talks about how there's these church leaders or these uh, religious leaders who came and, and they gave and the receptacle to receive the money was up front and they gave uh, a lot of heavy coins because when you drop heavy coins in, it's like clunk, clunk, clunk. Oh, look at them. They're very generous. Um, and it even said that sometimes some of those people would put stones and other things in the offering and uh, uh, they wanted to look good. But Jesus points out, how much of a faith-giving journey this widow was on to give such a big proportion of what she had. This is what mattered to him. God wants your heart more than he wants your money. He, God created the whole world. You really think that God is like, oh, if Calvin doesn't give that dollar amount, the world's going to end? No. He wants my heart. He wants me to be a joyful giver. That's what he wants for you too. But let me share a few little disclaimers. You ever read those disclaimers? No, nobody does. They were required by law so they don't get sued. Um, I'm just glad that you don't have to scroll through to the end anymore. You can just hit, yes, I read them. A um, couple of disclaimers with this. First one is this, giving to the church is not what saves you. If you're like, oh, I'll give some more money and then God will forgive me a few of those sins. And, or if I give to the church, then I'm good. Me and God are good and I'm going to heaven. That's not what saves. Repentance and believing in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that he died for you, he rose from the dead for you and he forgives you and you live a life for him, that, that's the process of salvation. Forgiveness is a heart issue, not a giving issue. Second one is this, you are not a lesser part of our church community if you don't give to the church. Um, just want you to know that. We love you. We're, we're happy that everybody is here, and, and we want to encourage everybody to take a next step in their, their faith journey, whether it's with giving, whether it's with serving, whether it's with what, whatever area it is in your life, but you are not a lesser part of our church. And the third one is this. No church should ever force you, coerce you, manipulate you to give more money. Just want you to hear that. No church should ever force you to do that. And if they do, leave. Just say, no, I, I don't want to be a part of that. Because that's not scriptural. Um, what, is the, uh, what does the Bible say about other places to give then? It talks about lots of different types of offering. It talks about free will offering talks about uh, supporting other ministries, giving to the poor, and, and all these are great places to be generous. We do this as a church. You may, not, you may or may not know this. As a church, 10% of everything we bring in, we give directly out to other ministries, to local 
partners, what we call loves local partners, to global partners, to church planting. 10% directly goes out, and then we save 5% for future church planting. Because we want to be a part, not only of the here and now, but of investing in the kingdom. We know that God cares about our hearts and what we do with our money. And so I'd encourage you to, to think about things like that. Um, we also know that there's things that come up, so we invest in things like uh, loving on teachers. We have a teacher event with school supplies. We do Easter egg hunts. We do lots of different things. Why? Because we know that if we love generously, people are going to ask why. And we can say because of Jesus. And this is what we want people to know. There's a better way that leads to life. Because God wants your heart more than he wants your money. And so I'd invite you to ask regularly this question. God, please show me what you want me to give and help me be faithful in doing it. He wants us to be faithful. But we live in God's economy, and it's an open-handed economy. And, and there's, there's times where it feels like, you, you, you ever notice when you're trying to save for something, it feels like the big expenditures always come when, when, you, uh, when you don't want them to. <laughs> and then there's other times when you're like, whatever, I spend the money, whatever, whatever, and it feels like, oh, doing pretty well in my bank account. Like control is something I want. Um, what about you? <laughs> Anybody else you want control? I want control over money and over choices and decisions. And, uh, but, but if you ask somebody who's been a Christian for a while that has faithfully been, been giving to the work of the Lord, um, generously been giving, they'll tell you that God's always faithful. Now, it doesn't mean if you give more, you get more. It doesn't mean if you give more, then your life is easier and better and happier. No. But we want to be joy-filled. Proverbs eleven twenty four says, One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. Um, it's hard to choose to really give faithfully, though, when you're living a life out of sync with the way of Jesus. Um, and so I want to look for a minute at just some practical advice on how to live. On the, we talked about giving. What about living? Um, well, first, I just want you to know that God wants us to enjoy His creation. Like, you're allowed to enjoy the things you have. Sometimes you feel guilty, right? You're like, oh, um, did you ever grow up with your parents wanting you to finish everything on your plate? And if you didn't, what would they say? Like the starving kids in whatever country, they, they can't eat that food. And... Uh, I mean, okay, I get the purpose behind that. Uh, but God, He wants us to enjoy what He's given to us. And I know this because why on earth would He create so many different types of birds? You ever thought about that? If God didn't care about you enjoying things, you would just have seagulls. That's what you'd have. Like nobody enjoys seagulls, right? Um, why? They poop everywhere and they have this annoying sound. Like He created all these different types of birds, colorful birds. He created the hummingbird. That is a, an anomaly. You still can't understand the hummingbird. Um, he created so many amazing things for us to enjoy. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Um, I think it's okay to enjoy some of the things God has, has given us. Now, you can do it to excess, absolutely. That's another message for another day. Um, but just some advice when it comes to how to live. I, I just encourage people to live within their means. I think that that's a, a helpful thing. But ultimately, to prayerfully make a wise financial plan with your family. Um, and as you do that, I would encourage you to pay off debt. Uh, now, yes, mortgages and all that, there's good debt, bad debt. That's not what we're really talking about. We're talking about the heart issue, right? If you're living within your means, you're saying, I don't need to get more and more and more debt so that everyone else can, can see how good I am or what I have and, and I'm successful. And it's not bad to be wealthy and have nice things, but it's a hard issue. What are you putting your trust in? What are you putting your, your success in? And then find resources for help. It's okay to ask for help. Uh, money is one of those touchy subjects, right? Oh, I don't want help. I don't want people to know my financial situation. Sometimes you need to let people know so they can help you. There's resources out there. There's things like Dave Ramsey. And you don't have to agree with everything someone says to learn from them. I just put that out there. There's a lot of good resources out there, and we'd love to help. Um, 
but there's a direct correlation between how we give and how we live. Now, like every ounce of blood in our body, it all runs through our heart. That's the correlation. And so ask yourself um, this question. Will you choose to increase your standard of living or your standard of giving? I've really been chewing on that recently. Um, Because just because you get more doesn't mean you need to spend more. Doesn't mean you need to buy more. Doesn't mean you need to grow that way. Sometimes it does. It's okay. (laughs) If you've been struggling and you get a pay raise and you're like, oh, finally I can do this. But it's a a heart thing and and we encourage you to pray through that. Um, The the second truth is, um, second choice is choose to be radical. Jesus, man, he was so radical in how he loves us. Just think about this for for a moment. We could never repay the debt that's been paid for us. Jesus died for you, rose from the dead. Everything you deserve, he took. And everything you didn't deserve, he's given to you. It's amazing. Now, my personality is, I don't mind pushing the envelope a little bit. Um... I don't mind being a little radical in certain areas. I like, I like some, some structure. But sometimes, if no one else is going to do it, you've got to be the person to do it. <laughs> Jesus was that guy. He was so radical. But he, all, he always did it for a, a good purpose so that people would know there's a better way that leads to life. We, we should love generously. Now, that's not a, a natural response in and out of ourselves, of ourselves. But it should be for when you receive the gospel, when you receive this generosity, it should be a natural response that it flows out of you. The problem is you don't always feel like other people deserve it, right? Like we're we're very quick to feel like we deserve grace, but I've got a lot of reasons why other people don't deserve grace. Um, You you remember the uh, TV show Extreme Home Makeover? Remember that show? Oh, it's awesome. And uh, they, they would always do this amazing thing in providing a new home for people who we deem to deserve it. Thinking about that, can you imagine if they did extreme home makeover, credit card debt edition? Imagine this, you're, you're hearing the story of this person and they're doing this amazing new home for this person and, and they need it because they went on a really nice vacation to Aruba and put it all on their credit card. And then when they came back, they bought a brand new car and now they're just so overwhelmed with debt that we thought, man, we're going to build them a house. You wouldn't want to watch that, would you? Now, I'm not saying that we should reward people for bad choices, but what I am saying is that maybe sometimes we need to show grace to people even when we feel like they don't deserve it. That's the way of Jesus. It's easier to give to someone that you think deserves it. It's a lot harder when you think they got themselves there, then get themselves out of it. I don't know what that looks like for you today. Um, I used to work with students and we would go on trips. And one trip that we would go on is this conference called Christ in Youth, a high school conference. And I'm sure we'll go on those with our students at some point. Uh, but there was one kid who, uh, um, they were responsible for buying them their lunch on the way down and on the way back. Everything else was covered. So the parents were given spending money. This one kid, I think, got like $200. I'm like, how much lunch are you buying? Um, but on our way back on the trip, we stopped for lunch, and I noticed he's not eating any food. So I'm like, what's going on? He spent all $200 of it on candy on the way down. I'm like, what are you doing? And I had this moment where I'm like, he still needs to eat lunch. I'm going to have to buy him lunch. Ah, uh, do you think he deserved it? I love it. Like, no, he should have saved his money. <laughs> no, but he needed to eat lunch. And man, grace is hard. It's hard to be generous. But God wants us, thirdly, to choose to be joyful. Choose to be joyful. Each, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves the cheerful giver. Not legalistically, but cheerfully. We, we are not required to tithe to the church and to give all our money away, all this kind of stuff, but God wants us out of a loving heart to, to invest in His ways. Uh, in the temple for the Jewish people, there was two receptacles that, that received money at the front. Um, one was what was required in, in the law, and so people would give begrudgingly for petition so that they knew that they were good to bring reconciliation between them and God. The other one was what they call free will offerings, alms. And uh, 
Um, it's funny that in Scripture, um, it talks a lot more about the people that gave to the free will offering than it did the people who begrudgingly gave. Because God loves a cheerful giver. Not a big giver. I mean, maybe. Not a little giver. He loves a cheerful giver. It's not about the dollar amount. It's about the heart of faithfulness. The heart of following the radical example of Jesus and the heart of giving cheerfully. He can bless the gift no matter what. But he wants to bless you, the giver. He wants you to give cheerfully. And everyone's invited, whether you got a little or a lot, everyone's invited to be a part of it. Oh. Because sacrifice sometimes is what's needed. And sacrifice is giving up something you love for something or someone you love more. I don't know what that looks like for you today in your journey, but I want you to try and trust God and see what he does. goes on to say in verse 8, and God is able to bless you abundantly. Isn't that true? So that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in what? Thanksgiving to God. Oh. God provides for us to be generous so that we can give him thanksgiving. We can point people to him. We can love generously. So people go, that doesn't make sense. Why? Because I'm radical. And I follow a Savior who calls me to love like he does. Love generously. So as we close today, let's ask this question from Psalm 116, 12 again. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? You've got to make a decision. Not my decision for you to make, your decision as a, as a family. As you look at the principles of, of God's best. And here's what I know. I don't want to wait till I become rich to start being generous. I don't want to wait till I become better and more talented to start being generous. I want to use what he's given, my gifts, my talents, my, my treasure, my money, anything about me to invest in the here and the kingdom impact. I want God to look at me and like we said last week, I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. So that's the question for you. What do you want your story to be when it comes to how people see you in relation to your money, in relation to your faith and who God calls you to be. Let's pray. God, you are so good. We're so thankful for how generous you are to us. And we're so thankful that we get to choose in how to continue to follow you and be generous in that. God, we love you and pray in your name.